Hey everybody, it's Party Elite here with the first of many Tomb Kings videos for the weekend. This one is going to take a closer look at various aspects of the faction, including the lords, their skill trees, faction details, and more. For a detailed look at the lore of Nehekara or the roster, take a look at either of the two videos linked under the eye at the top right corner of the screen or at the end of the video. We're going to start, of course, with the faction leader, Setra the Imperishable. Starting in Khemri in both Vortex and Mortal Empires campaigns, Setra starts his campaign with a unit of Tomb Guards with Halberds and a Hemrian War Sphinx. His faction buffs largely deal with him trying to bring back the glory of his lost empire, public order and growth buffs alongside a reduction to construction time. As a lord, his leadership aura has a massive 100% size increase and his Tomb Guards and Skeleton Chariots also get an extra bump to the replenishment rate. Fans of wastelands, savannas, and deserts, these guys are not fans of temperate mountain or jungle climates and particularly hate frozen, chaos-infested, or wood elf-infested parts of the world, and that is a commonality across the board outside of a few exclusions that I will point out. Now, a very interesting trait of Cetras is his title. Starting off as merely the imperishable, as you increase the wealth of the faction, you go further up this chain of titles, unlocking Khemrihara, High King of Nehara, the King of Kings, each step giving you better income from buildings and raiding. Now let's take a moment to discuss Cetra's skill tree. A lot of the Tomb King Lord skill trees are going to have common points, so I'm going to be in depth with Cetra's and gloss over some of the common points when I'm discussing the other Lords' uh, skill trees. And you'll also notice, of course, some things that are common between Tomb King Lords and other Lords as well. But let's take a look at Cetra's to start things off. The blue line here, as you can see, again, very common between factions we've got campaign movement buffs we've got public order buffs uh increase from to income from raiding we've got uh, casualty replenishment rate increases this one's a little unique though canopic jar hoarder you'll see that across tomb kings uh of course it's not going to be with any other faction but it basically affects how many canopic jars are generated per turn and uh that is a very important resource in tomb king campaigns so you can imagine uh, that's a pretty important skill to have then we've got Attend Me, which is a hilarious name for a skill that just increases unit experience for new recruits and also increases local recruitment capacity. Then again, we've got Lightning Strike in its righteous place here. Good spot. It's nice to see it there. Uh, you can get it relatively early on in the campaign if you spec towards it. Then we've got Imperishable that reduces casualties suffered from attrition. Uh, we've got All Is Mine increasing the income from looting, sacking, and post-battle. Then we've got the Dead Sand Sentinel, and this just increases ambush success chance down the line here. It's all the way at the end, so uh, you'll have to wait until you clear out the Attend Me line before you can even unlock the buffed ambush success chances. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And then all the way at the end, we've got Renowned and Feared, pretty common across some regular lords as well. The red line, of course, buffs various units within the Lord's army. We start off with Passage to the Soul Realm, which is the character's aura leadership effect plus five, just a different name for the same effect. Then we've got Arrows of Asaf that increases ammo and missile damage for various archer units. Sun Scorched Bones that's going to help out with armor and melee defense for specific units. Again, I'm not going to get into too much depth listing everything out here. You can see quite a bit of it on screen as well. The Elite Cavalrymen, uh, Master Charioteers, which doesn't just help chariots, but also helps uh, War Sphinxes and the like. Revered Stone Masonry, increasing melee defense uh, and melee attack and missile damage going down the line here for various constructs. Stone Sentinels doing the same, increasing charge bonus and then melee attack and weapon strength ultimately as well for various constructs as well. And then over here in the center, we've got Reanimate, which is, again, just another name for something that buffs leadership. It's a plus 16 to leadership, 40 meter range, lasting for 14 seconds. You'd think with a name like Reanimate, it would also reanimate some of the dead and give a little bit of replenishment, but it does not do that. Uh, then we've got Blessing of the Asp, and this, again, just affects units that are rank 7 and above. Uh, of course, this is a bit more ammo-based, missile-based. We've got Dune Rider, which, again, does the same thing. Various other units, rank 7 and above only. And then Unfading Memory, same thing, rank 7 and above, just for different units. And Ancient Stone, rank 7 and above, again, for different units. I'm starting to sound like a broken record. And then all the way at the end, we've got Resurrect, and this replaces Reanimate and it still has that same plus 16 leadership buff, but it also replenishes hit points. So there you have it. There is a little bit of regeneration available uh, in this red line over here, and that is pretty important. Regeneration and resurrection, etc., is not easy to come by when you're playing as the Tomb Kings. It's not like the Vampire Counts. There's no invocation of Nehek or anything, so uh, that's an important skill at the end there. Now, this line over here is just the lore of Nehekara. So if you want to learn a bit more about that lore, I have a separate video up about that. You can check it out under the eye at the top right corner of the screen. I go into details about every spell, whether they're good, what they're worth, etc., etc., what they do. So uh, 
you know, check that video out for details over there. We've got evasion in the center over here, and that is your standard plus five to melee defense and increase to speed as well. And then all the way at the end, we've got your usual earthing, power drain, and arcane conduit. Important to keep in mind, it's a regular arcane conduit, not a greater arcane conduit. Then the line above that is a little bit, uh, again, it's similar to other lords that we've seen in other factions. It's just to buff the lord himself. We've got Indomitable Will, increasing charge bonus and leadership. Conqueror, that helps melee attack and weapon strength. Blade Master, that's going to increase melee attack. Hard to hit, which is going to increase melee defense. Indomitable, again, buffing up leadership. In the center here, we've got Tomb Strike, which really sounds like a wrestling move. Uh, and that increases uh, melee attack and weapon damage and also enables the Lord to cause terror, the possibility of causing terror. So that's pretty great. It can really change an engagement, especially if terror kicks in and you know sends a bunch of like peasants running or something. Then next up, we've got in this new bucket, the Wound Maker, which increases weapon strength, full plate armor, which of course increases armor, devastating charge, which obviously increases charge bonuses, and over my dead body, which is quite ironic, and that increases speed, and then later on speed and hit points. Then at the end, Desert Strike replaces Tomb Strike, and that gives a massive buff to weapon damage, a plus 50% buff there, plus 44 melee attack, and of course the ability to cause terror as well. So pretty intense ability at the end over there. Now back to the start over here, we have somewhat of a unique line, of course, over here, starting with Tra, the Great Father, that gives plus 8 leadership for Tomb Guard and Chariot units in the Lord's Army. It also gives a recruitment rank buff to plus 2 for Tomb Princes, and it also increases melee defense for Tomb Guard and Chariot units in the Lord's Army. Then Unyielding Will is an ability that is unique to Cetra, but it's similar to other abilities that other Tomb Kings have as well. It gives a plus 5 to melee attack and melee defense in a constant area around uh, the Lord, 55 meters around him. Then this first bucket has Conqueror of the Past that increases public order for all provinces while reducing public order for the local enemy province. It buffs up unit recruitment rank by plus 1, and it also increases local recruitment capacity. Then we've got Founder of Hemri, and that increases the Hero Capacity and Hero Recruitment Rank for Tomb Princes. And you can see Level 1 and Level 2 just buff those numbers up a little bit higher. Next up, Restless Minions increases the unit capacity for Tomb Guards, Tomb Guards with Halberds, Skeleton Chariots, and Skeleton Archer Chariots. And it also buffs Melee Attack plus 5 for Tomb Guard and Chariot Units. And you can see at Level 2, it adds Vanguard Deployment for Skeleton Chariot Units. So you can definitely have some fun with that. Now, this is a pretty important skill, uh, mainly because of that increase in unit capacity. It's quite a limiting factor in a fun way, I would say, for the Tomb Kings. So it's nice to see some skills that unlock increased unit capacity, so just keep that one in mind, Restless Minions. Trampler of the Ages comes up next, speed plus eight and charge bonus plus 10 for everyone in the Lord's Army. And we end that line with the Immortal King of Nehara, and that gives a charge bonus plus 12% and physical resistance 10%. Now, physical resistance can really be buffed up insanely when you're playing as the Tomb Kings. And you'll see me talk about it later on in this video, and it ties in with use of various spells as well that can really get physical resistance insanely high. So just keep that in mind when you're specking your lords. Up top over here, we've got a couple of unique quest items. The Crown of Nehara, which is a quest battle, will unlock plus 10% armor piercing damage and plus 10% weapon damage alongside a plus 8% charge bonus. Sounds like it's made to lead chariot charges. It affects allies in a 55 meter range around Cetra. Then we've got the Blessed Blade of Tra, and this imbues fire damage to the weapon, and it also blinds enemies that are attacked, and that's absolutely massive. Reducing their melee stats by 26 and 27 for attack and defense is huge, because most low-tier and mid-tier Tomb King units don't have extremely high stats, so you go, you're going to rely on buffs and debuffs like this. Then we've got all the mounts, the Skeletal Steed, the Hemrian War Sphinx, the Chariot of the Gods, then up here we've got Returned in Madness, which increases charge bonus and again buffs physical resistance, so you can really buff those really high. Ancient Tyrant reduces public order for the local enemy provinces while increasing income from sacking settlements. Embalmed in Elixir increases hit points and also increases fire resistance by 15%, and that helps counter the innate weakness to fire that these mummies have because they're wrapped up in bandages and so they can you know light up very easily and then finally we've got the ceremonial bandages which increases missile resistance by 15 percent so a pretty interesting skill tree overall you'll see some of these things be common across tomb kings of course that's how it works but it's nice to see some things pretty unique between these guys and other factions so let's hop out of this screen on the battlefield, we're seeing a lord with some pretty fantastic melee stats. A decent bit of armor, a great deal of armor piercing anti-large damage, split between 330 armor piercing and 20 bonus versus large, and magic to go alongside it all. Atop the skeletal steed, we see normal increases to speed, charge bonus, and health, 
while being atop a Hemrian War Sphinx gives a massive increase to health, armor, and charge bonus, while also buffing speed and weapon strength at the cost of melee attack and defense stats. This also trades the anti-large capabilities for anti-infantry strength to the tune of 345 armor piercing and a 15 bonus versus infantry. Finally, the Chariot of the Gods as his most expensive mount option gives a huge buff to charge bonus and speed with increases to health and armor and reduction in melee attack and defense stats as well as weapon strength. This does add fire and magic damage however and changes anti-large capabilities to anti-infantry splitting 295 armor piercing and a 20 bonus versus infantry. Whether mounted or not, Cetra has 15% missile resistance and a 25% weakness to fire, which is a hilarious representation of the fact that he's wrapped in bandages. He causes fear and otherwise behaves as an undead unit with crumbling and disintegration. With access to the lore of Nehara, he has some fairly strong magic at his disposal as well, but you can learn about magic in my magic video that I linked to at the top right corner. One of his Lord abilities, the Curse, is an area direct damage passive ability that causes damage to combatants within 40 meters of Cetra as long as his health is below 50%, it'll only trigger once and it'll last for a mere 15 seconds. Unyielding Will is an area augment ability that works passively within a 55 meter radius, giving a plus 5 melee attack and melee defense to allies. When it comes to low tier Tomb King units, this is an excellent piece of assistance. Finally, the Wrath of Tra creates an explosion much like Verminous Valor, throwing infantry around, causing some magical and fire damage, but most importantly, clearing a way for Cetra to get through a clump without damaging any of his own. It can be used thrice in a battle, and he can bring two items to the field as well, the Crown of Nehekara, increasing armor piercing and weapon damage by 10% and charge bonus by 8%, another passive, this remains active in a 55 meter radius around Cetra and can provide a fair bit of assistance, especially to the dreaded Bone Train. The Blessed Blade of Tra, on the other hand, is an active ability with a 120 second cooldown and a 43 second duration. It adds fire damage to Cetra's melee, and it also allows him to blind those he strikes for 10 seconds at a time, reducing melee attack and defense by 26 and 27, alongside accuracy, which gets a reduction of 40%. Next up, Grand Hierophant Khattep, leading the Exiles of Nehek. The faction effects here are all reflective of the campaign map situation as well as the mission that Khattep is on. The only negative is the reduced diplomatic relations with the Dark Elves, but apart from that, we see mountains being added as a suitable climate, generating canopic jars every turn, buffing campaign movement range, and increasing casualty replenishment rates. Khattep, as a lord, ensures a bigger capacity and recruitment rank for Lich Priests of all types. Starting with a unit of Carrion and a Hyro Titan, Khattep starts in Nagarond, further north or south depending on the Vortex or Mortal Empires campaigns, and he's likely to deal with the Dark Elves right from the start either way. Alright, let's quickly take a look at Hatep's skill tree. Again, a lot of things are pretty similar. You can see the bottom two lines are basically the same as Cetra's, or literally the same as Cetra's, so nothing really to go over there. Again, just quickly scrolling down it so you can see it's all the same, and we can expect that, obviously. Now let's take a look at, uh, well, this line over here as well is actually the same because he has access to the lore of Nehara, and uh, you can obviously see the other video about that as we discussed with Cetra as well, Evasion, Earthing, Power Drain, and Arcane Conduit are all a part of this line, so just similar to Cetra as a caster, that line is pretty common. The unique stuff. Geheb, the god of Earth, reduces attrition by 25% from all forms of attrition. That's just for the Lord's Army, of course. Then it also buffs melee attack and melee defense by plus 5 for Ushapti and Ushapti with Great Bow units, and it increases experience when recruiting Ushapti units by plus 2. Reanimator over here increases the leadership aura size and gives plus 8 to leadership for Nehara warriors, skeleton warriors, skeleton spearmen, skeleton archers, and tomb guard units. Sandstorm basically reduces the cooldown time by 30% for the Sandstorm ability, and it also increases the number of times it can be used by plus 1. Then we've got Steed Reanimation over here giving leadership and melee attack buffs for Nehara horsemen, skeleton horsemen archers, skeleton chariots, and skeleton archer chariot units. Then Tomb Protector increases the Tomb Guard unit capacity by plus 2, and it also increases the Casualty Replenishment Rate by plus 10% for Tomb Guard units, and that's obviously just in the Lord's Army. Lich Lord over here increases the Hero Capacity and Hero Recruitment Rank for Lich Priests, and at the end here, the Grand Hierophant increases the Winds of Magic Power Reserve, and it also increases the Hero Action Success Chance by plus 5% for Lich Priests across the faction. Up top over here, you can see the one quest battle, the Lich Staff here, which is a hex that is active constantly across the map, increasing the ability recharge rate for enemy 
uh, units and, and their abilities, obviously. Then over here, we've got the Skeletal Steed, the Skeleton Chariot, and the Casket of Souls as various mounts you can unlock, followed by Arcane Knowledge, which increases magic resistance by 15%, and also reduces the enemy's Winds of Magic Power Reserve by 5 when you're within the region. Mortuary Cult Scholar increases the Canopic Jar generation per turn, and it also unlocks Lich Priests for recruitment, and it also increases how many Lich Priests you can actually recruit. Witness to the Golden Age is a beautiful name, just you know, going back to the lore of the Tomb Kings. Uh, I love the name. It increases research rate plus 5% because, you know, he's actually seen this stuff. He knows what happened, uh, so he, he can help with the research. I love it. And then construction cost reduction as well, uh, which makes a little bit less sense, I guess. He's not a necrotech, but it's still cool. I love it. It reduces the cost of uh, construction in the local province. And finally, soul binding increases physical resistance by 10% for Nehara Warriors, Skeleton Warriors, Skeleton Spearmen, Skeleton Archers, and Tomb Guard units, and also increases their experience by plus two, just for the Lord's Army, of course, for both of those abilities. So that is Hatep's skill tree. Again, a lot of things in common between, or within a faction as well as between Lords of various factions, but uh, let's move on and take a look at what's next. On the battlefield, Khatep isn't really equipped for melee. His armor and melee stats are low, his charge bonus is pitiful, and his weapon strength is good only if you consider the fact that he's a caster lord. Atop a skeletal steed, we see an increase in health, charge bonus, and speed, while the skeleton chariot at least makes him a viable hit and run unit. Terribly low melee stats are complemented by a generous buff to armor, weapon strength, and charge bonus, alongside increases in health and speed, a decrease in melee defense, but a bonus of 28 versus infantry. Finally, as a unique mount, we've got the Casket of Souls, so that means Artillery Lords are a thing now. This buffs health a little bit, gives some decent armor, but reduces speed, of course, and melee defense and charge bonus as well. Weapon Strength is greatly buffed, and right, it's a goddamn artillery piece that can fire magic ammo that deals a great amount of damage, splitting 860 points into 90 armor piercing and 56 explosive armor piercing. It's slow to fire, but it shoots 7 projectiles when it does, and can do quite some work. Now he comes in with 15% missile resistance and comes with regular undead style traits and is the only Tomb King Lord not to be wrapped in bandages apparently, since he does not suffer a weakness to fire like all other Lich Priests as well. Bringing the Casket of Souls gives him the Covenant of Power unit ability which greatly increases power reserves. As a Lich Priest of the Lore of Nehara, he of course has access to all the spells that go with it and the lore attribute too. Beyond that, he has access to The Curse and My Will Be Done, similar to Cetra's Unyielding Will, alongside Arcane Conduit and Sandstorm, a 14 second vortex that causes a fair bit of damage with a lot of armor piercing damage from what I can see in a large area, but it can only be cast three times. Finally, he can bring the Lich Staff to the field, triggering when casting, which increases ability recharge times for the enemy. Pretty handy. High Queen Khalida is the next lord to discuss. Leading the court of Libaris, the faction adds jungles as a suitable climate and sees increased diplomatic relations with other tomb kings alongside a buff to ammunition across all armies. Khalida herself adds poison attacks to her own army, reduces attrition losses by 50% for them as well, and gives a buff to untainted in her local province. Starting with Necropolis Knights and Sepulchral Stalkers, Khalida begins the Vortex Campaign in Lustria, near the Vampire Coast that makes a viable and ideal target for somebody who loathes vampires, and in Mortal Empires, however, she starts at her home city of Libaris, giving her the biggest variety in starts. Looking at High Queen Khalida's skill tree, you can see the bottom two lines are basically the same uh, as compared to other Tomb King legendary lords, so nothing really to look at there that's new, it's all the same abilities and capabilities and buffs. Uh, this line over here is a little different, we've got Indomitable Will to start things off, charge bonus plus 5, leadership plus 4, and then Graceful Warrior over here buffing speed and melee defense. Then we've got Blade Master buffing melee attack, hard to hit buffing melee defense, Indomitable again buffing leadership a little bit further, followed by Tomb Strike over here, again plus 26 to melee attack, plus 25% weapon damage, can cause terror, and it sounds like a wrestling move. Then we've got Wound Maker over here, buffing weapon strength, full plate armor, buffing armor, devastating charge, buffing charge bonus, over my dead body again, buffing speed, and then eventually hit points as well, and then Desert Strike to end it all, just like we've seen before. So a little different at the start there, but similar at the end. What's unique over here are these top two lines, of course. 
Starting off with Asaf, the goddess of magic and vengeance, which might be the longest skill name we have seen to date. This, available at rank 10, gives a boost to Winds of Magic Power Reserve by plus 15, increases Ambush Success Chance by 15%, and it also increases Missile Damage by 12% for Skeleton Archers and Sepulchral Stalker units. The True Blessing of Asaf replaces the regular Blessing of Asaf, or the, I don't know, False Blessing of Asaf, I guess, uh, and that affects allies within a 40 meter range, giving plus 20% Armor Piercing Missile Damage, plus 25 Reload Skill, and plus 20% Missile Damage as well. So, of course, with Khalida, you can expect some buffs to ranged units. Up next, we've got Purified, which reduces the amount of attrition taken, and it also eventually pops Regeneration down the line here uh, when you unlock it. Then we've got Libaris Best, and that increases unit experience by plus 3 for Skeleton Archer unit recruits, and it also increases ammo for Skeleton Archers across the faction by 25%. Legions of the Asp Goddess is actually an army ability that is unlocked for all local armies, and that is a wind spell, which uh, is pretty devastating. We'll take a look at it later, perhaps. And then we've got the Embodiment of Asaf, and that increases melee attack by plus 5 for Sepulchral Stalker and Necropolis Knight units, and then melee defense for those same units as well by plus 5. Finally, Warrior Queen all the way at the end over here buffs Physical Resistance, and it also applies the Frenzy passive ability to High Queen Khalida. Now, as I mentioned before multiple times already, I think Physical Resistance can be buffed to insane heights with the Tomb King, so keep that in mind. Up top here, as you can see, we've got one quest item, which is the Venom Staff, and that is a magic missile that we've we sort of guessed way, way, way long ago that it would be a magic missile. Then we've got some mounts here, the Skeleton Chariot, the Necro Serpent. We've got Returned in Madness, increasing charge bonus and physical resistance, Ancient Tyrant, reducing local public order for enemy provinces while increasing income from sacking settlements. We've got Embalmed in, Elix in Elixir, again, buffing hit points, and increasing fire resistance as well. And finally, Ceremonial Badges, which buffs Missile Resistance. So you can see which parts stay common across these lords and which parts are a little unique. So that is High Queen Khalida's skill tree. On the battlefield, she makes for a very capable combatant, bringing decent stats across the board alongside poison attacks and melee. Atop her chariot, her armor and health get significant boosts alongside speed and charge bonus benefits, of course, at the cost of melee stats and weapon strength, though the weapon strength does give a nice 28 bonus versus infantry. The Necro Serpent is the other mount option, giving a decent buff to health, armor, and speed, and giving 315 points of armor piercing damage as well. A typical undead lord with an added 15% missile resistance and a 25% weakness to fire, her abilities include the Curse and My Will Be Done, just like you know, previous lords, as well as a few unique ones. Blessing of Asaf is a passive area augment that increases missile damage, reload skill, and armor piercing missile damage in a 40 meter radius around her, while Venom Wave is an explosion that can be used thrice in a battle, dealing poison debuffs, magical damage, and a fair bit of disruption without harming any friendly troops. Finally, Tomb Strike, which sounds like a wrestling move, is an active ability that gives plus 26 melee attack, plus 25% weapon damage, and gives her the ability to cause terror. Great for quickly turning an engagement with morale damage. Finally, her one and only item is the Venom Staff, which, as predicted, is a magic missile. Last but not least, Arhan the Black leads the followers of Nagash, and if you know anything about the lore, you'll understand why Arhan can recruit Vampire Count units and has better diplomatic relations with Vampire Counts and reduced diplomatic relations with Tomb Kings. He also has plus 10 wins of magic reserves for all armies, and Vampiric Corruption doesn't affect public order. Heroes in his army also see slight buffs to melee attack and defense, and starting with a Tomb Scorpion and some Crypt Ghouls, he will start at the Wizard Caliph's Palace in the Vortex Campaign, while Mortal Empires has him shifting over to the Sorcerer's Island nearby. This just makes me think that he's making room for an Araby start position. Looking at the skill tree again, you can see things are pretty common across the board with the bottom two lines, so I'm just going to scroll down this so you can see how everything is basically the same, the same abilities, the same buffs, etc. down the bottom two lines. Over here, we've got uh, the Lore of Death, so again, that's similar to any Lore of Death caster, of course, and that makes perfect sense based on his background. So that's Lore of Death, we've got Evasion, Earthing, Power Drain, and Arcane Conduit as well. The line just above it is similar to Cetra, but there is something unique at the end. We've got Indomitable Will, Charge Bonus plus 5, Leadership plus 4, Conqueror buffing melee attack and weapon strength, Blademaster buffing melee attack, Hard to Hit buffing melee defense, Indomitable buffing leadership. 
Tomb Strike in the center here as before, just buffing melee attack and weapon damage and also giving the ability to cause terror. Then we've got Wound Maker, buffing weapon strength, Full Plate Armor, buffing armor, Devastating Charge, increasing charge bonuses, and Over My Dead Body, increasing speed and ultimately hit points as well. And all the way at the end, Necro Strike is a little different for him. Uh, that increases only weapon damage, but it does it by a whopping 75% and it allows the ability to cause terror, which we've seen before. So just a little different uh, for him as opposed to his Tomb King brothers and sisters. Up top over here, the two unique lines. We've got Osirian, the god of the underworld, available at rank 10, casualty replenishment buff by 15%. It also increases missile damage by 15% for the Casket of Souls units, and those are both for the Lord's Army, while it also increases local recruitment capacity by plus two in the local province. Vengeful unlocks the Befallen Curse, which replaces the regular curse, and that is a direct damage ability that triggers right away when hit points are dropped below 50%. It's got an effect radius of 40 meters, and it just causes some damage, and it also reduces enemy vigor. Uh, then we've got the Curse of Undeath over here. That's a little bit of regeneration assistance that Arhan can have, and it's going to help the army out a fair bit. We've also got Martial Prowess, increases armor and melee defense, Legions of Death, increasing leadership and casualty replenishment rates. And then we've got the Lich King over here, increasing the hero capacity and recruitment rank for Lich Priests. Then finally, all the way at the end, we've got the Right Hand of Nagash, and that increases Winds of Magic Power Reserve by 15, increases hit points by 10%, and also reduces enemy leadership by 8 in the local region, which is quite a powerful ability, especially when you're fighting with lower leadership armies. Then over here, we've got the one unique quest item. That's the Tomb Blade of Arhan, and that allows for replenishment of hit points within a 30 meter radius of Arhan himself, and it actually heals injured units before resurrecting them, as we can expect of uh, typical undead resurrection spells. Then we've got the mounts, the Skeletal Steed, as well as the Skeleton Chariot, and then Returned in Madness, increasing charge bonus and physical resistance, Ancient Tyrant, which reduces public order for enemies in a local enemy province, and it also increases the income from sacking settlements. Then we've got Embalmed in Elixir, which we've seen before, buffing hit points and fire resistance. And then finally, Ceremonial Bandages for him as well, just buffing his missile resistance by an additional 15%. So again, a lot of things similar to other Tomb King Lords, but of course there are some unique bits and they do uh, sort of embody his lore and background. Arhan the Black is also built as sort of a caster lord on the battlefield, though he's a little better off in melee than Grand Hierophant Hattep. Middling stats across the board, but with access to the lore of death, he can get some work done, but don't send him into a duel against Grimgore anytime soon. Atop his skeletal steed, he gains some health and speed, alongside a buff to charge bonus, while his unique floating chariot, simply called Skeleton Chariot, gives him a buff to health, armor, speed, and charge bonus, while reducing melee stats and weapon strength the last of those quite significantly. However, it does give him a 28 bonus versus infantry and the strider trait. He has the same 15% missile resistance and is also hit with a 25% weakness to fire and is otherwise similar to an undead character. The lore of death is available to him, of course, alongside the curse and my will be done. The Libra Mortis is an ability unique to him lasting 20 seconds with a cooldown of 90 between its maximum of three uses, giving a whopping 44% physical resistance in a 40 meter range. Now you might wonder if this stacks with Nehru's Incantation of Protection, and it does. You can get up to an 88% physical resistance on a single unit with this combination. Finally, Arhan has two items available to him. The Staff of Nagash, which lasts for 33 seconds and buffs power recharge rate, and the Tomb Blade of Arhan, which lasts 23 seconds, affects allies within 30 meters of him, triggers when in melee, and recharges when in melee, giving fire damage while also replenishing hit points and resurrecting dead troops. The only non-legendary lord that the Tomb Kings have access to in multiplayer, and in single player of course, is the generic Tomb King. These guys come in with silver shields, decent armor, and decent stats all around, alongside the typical missile resistance and fire weakness and undead traits. On a skeletal steed, we see health, speed, and charge bonus get buffed, while a skeleton chariot increases health, armor, speed, and charge bonus at the expense of melee stats and weapon strength, though it adds a 28 bonus versus infantry. The Hemrian War Sphinx is a mount option as well, giving a lot more health, armor, and speed, alongside buffs to charge bonus and weapon strength, with the addition of armor piercing and bonus versus infantry, though there's a slight reduction in melee attack and defense stats. Abilities include the Curse, My Will Be Done, and Tomb Strike, which we've seen before, as well as Reanimate, which despite the name, only increases leadership by 16 in a 40 meter radius for 14 seconds. 
Items include Scorpion Armor that gives a 22% damage resistance buff as long as health is below 50%, and the Amulet of Fasta, which is a hex that lasts 22 seconds, hitting enemies within 55 meters with a negative 30 to armor and negative 48 to missile parry if they have shields. You'd think that the Amulet of Fasta would give a speed buff, but no, I guess there's no pun to be had here. Looking at the dynasties, we can see some of the Toon Kings that can be unlocked with the special buffs and abilities uh, through research. We've got Wahaf of the First Dynasty, who, I mean, of course, it adds him as a recruitment pool option. Uh, he has plus 8 melee attack when fighting in desert terrain. He's got plus 16 to his charge bonus, plus 20% ambush success chance, and plus 10% range for units in his army, and he's able to stock. Then, Rahash of the Second Dynasty has Public Order plus 1 for all provinces, a Character Aura Leadership Effect plus 5, Leadership Aura Size plus 20%, a Ward Save of 5%, and a Tax Rate Buff of 5% across the faction. Thuktep of the Third Dynasty increases armor by plus 5 for Hemrian War Sphinxes and Necro Sphinx units. He also has a Unit Capacity Increase, plus 1 for Hemrian War Sphinxes. Uh, construction Time is reduced, negative 35% for all buildings. Uh, armor Buff by plus 10, and additional tradable resources produced, plus 10%. Uh, then we've got Lamizash whose name I'm butchering and I don't know if I'll ever get right. Uh, he gets, I don't know if I'm getting any of them right actually, but he gets plus 10% missile damage for Oshapti with great bow units in his own army, gets melee attack plus six for Oshapti units in his own army, and he gets a unit capacity plus two for Oshapti, and he also gets a melee attack plus eight, while Settep of the 5th Dynasty has uh, Hero Action Success Chance plus 5% for Lich Priests, Hero Recruit Rank plus 2 for Lich Priests, Magic Resistance 20%, Winds of Magic Power Reserve plus 5 for all armies, and Untainted plus 5 for the local province, while Alcazar the 2nd of the 6th Dynasty has Weapon Strength plus 20% for Skeleton Chariots and Skeleton Archer Chariot Units, Missile Damage plus 20% for Skeleton Archer Chariot Units, and then Unit Capacity plus 2 for Skeleton Archer Chariots and Skeleton Chariots, and then he's also got Speed plus 5% for units in his own army. So as you can see, each of these dynasties unlocks a unique Tomb King that will have you know separate things that make them special in their own way. All right, with all that out of the way, we're going to take a look at the agents as well as the rest of the faction's units. But this video is getting a little chunky, so we're going to save that for the next video, which should be live right now as well, available under the eye at the top right corner of the screen, or there should be a button somewhere on screen as well. As always, thank you very much for watching, and remember to subscribe for more early access content from Total War, as well as a constant flow of campaigns, battles, and tactical analysis. There's going to be a lot of Total War to cover this year, and I look forward to every bit of it. Until next time... Cheers.